is that sometimes a, a person will go into therapy with one kind of problem. Um, maybe she's depressed or maybe she's got an uh, eating disorder or maybe she's anxious. And she comes out of this therapy with a different problem. She thinks she was raped for 10 years and, and repressed her memories of all this horrific trauma. Hey guys, welcome to an all new episode of Insights, a scientific talk show where we talk with uh, well different experts regarding different topics around the globe. And today uh, I'm very honored to present Dr. Elizabeth Loftus, who is a distinguished professor at the University of California at Irvine. She holds uh, several faculty positions in the Department of Psychological Science, the Department of Criminology, Law and Society, and the School of Law. Dr. Loftus received her PhD in psychology from Stanford University, and since then she has published over 20 books and over 600 scientific articles. Uh, Dr. Loftus's research has focused on the malleability of human memory, and she has been recognized for her research with eight honorary doctorates and election to numerous prestigious societies. Dr. Loftus has won more than a dozen major awards for her scientific work, work sorry, which include uh, the James McKean Cattle Fellow for a career of significant intellectual contributions to the science of psychology in the area of applied psychological research, and the William James Fellow Award for ingeniously and rigorously designed research studies that yielded clear objective evidence on difficult and controversial questions. More recently, she was awarded the John Maddox Prize for um, Nature Magazine for courage in promoting science and facing hostility in doing so. And uh, well, uh, I, I could go on and on with uh, introducing Dr. Loftus's uh, numerous awards and recognitions. And I'm so, so happy uh, to be able to talk a little bit about you and your career. Dr. Loftus, how are you? Good, thank you. So, uh, Dr. Loftus, I would like to start by uh, asking, how did you become interested in the study of memory and, well, subsequently in the formation of, on, of false memories? Well, that's, this goes way back. Um, I was a student, undergraduate student at UCLA. I was majoring in mathematics uh, and um, I took a psychology course uh, while I was a student and I absolutely loved it. So I took more psychology uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, I had enough credits to graduate with a double major in mathematics and psychology. And um, the reason I went to Stanford for graduate school is because they had a, a program in mathematical psychology. Um, but when I got there and I started to really realize what mathematical psychology was, I wasn't that interested in it, but I did get a chance to work with a professor on an experiment involving memory. And, and so it was really then in grad school that I learned how to become an experimental psychologist and to study memory. Although I didn't really get interested in false memories until quite a bit later after I had already gotten my PhD and was uh, teaching uh, at, at a university and doing, uh, doing research. Okay. Oh, that's actually quite uh, fun to learn that you originally uh, were interested in majoring in mathematics. I, I actually started uh, a major in mathematics myself also before going into, the, into psychology. Okay, so we have that in common. So. That in common, yeah. And well, talking yeah now specifically uh, about false memories, how could we explain to a lay person what we uh, refer? I think it's pretty descriptive, but how could we could we explain the concept of false memories to to the lay person? A false memory is a memory for something that didn't happen. Um, sometimes it's a memory about an event that did happen, but you have some mistaken memory about a detail of, of the event. 
-hmm. So it's a, a little bit of a false memory in an otherwise true experience. But we can also have completely false memories, very, what we now call rich false memories about experiences that we never had. Okay, uh, I think uh, most of us tend to rely a lot of our on our memory to uh, recall some past events or to testify about some of, of them to uh, to tell it to other people. But how sure can we be of our everyday memories? Uh, maybe experiences that are not very emotional. Uh, how malleable is memory? Obviously, memory is pretty important to us, and and um, often it serves us very well. With a, without memory, I, I wouldn't know how to sit down at, at the computer and fire it up and figure out how to how to talk to you today or uh, make the coffee or uh, find the car keys uh, to be yeah. able to drive the car. So memory does serve us very well, but. It's also the case that we memory can go awry and we can misremember things and we can have false memories. And, and probably we have many more false memories than we even realize, because for the most part, if, if, if you have a false memory, you often don't get caught. So, so if I tell you um, that I had chicken last night instead of a uh, pizza, um, you don't know what the truth is and you just accept my story and, and you don't challenge it and I don't get caught making that mistake. But, but when it comes to legal cases where very precise memory is crucial and can, can be the difference between freedom and, and not freedom or life and death, uh, then it matters. Very precise memory matters. And, um, And I, I just think we have to accept the fact that there is error in our memory and, and then we learn how to deal with it. Yes. What are like the most common, uh, maybe experimental methods that uh, are used to in, the, in this field of study? Like what are some of these paradigms that, that you have uh, developed for studying false memories? In my case, uh... Well, one of the common paradigms is, is called the misinformation paradigm. Um, and what happens here in this kind of a study is that we might show somebody a simulated crime or a simulated accident. They'll see some event, they'll experience the event, just, just the way a real crime witness would experience a real event. Afterwards, we'll expose people to some erroneous information. They'll talk to another witness who, who recounts what happens but makes a mistake. They'll get interviewed by a biased interviewer who suggests an erroneous detail, some kind of post-event misinformation. And then in the final stage of the experiment, we uh, question people about what they remember seeing. Just what do you remember yourself? And so we can look and we can see how, how the new information can affect people. And what we find is that very often it can contaminate or transform somebody's memory. So, so we can make people believe that a car went through a stop sign instead of a yield sign, or we can make them believe that the perpetrator of a crime was wearing a brown jacket when it was a green jacket. It's pretty easy to change people's memories for the details of something uh, that they've experienced. And, and, and the misinformation research, the, the, the hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of studies that have looked at this demonstrate uh, that phenomenon, the misinformation effect. I'm wondering, uh, have you found some like crucial variables that may uh, make some people uh, some some people more vulnerable to to the creation of a false memory or maybe uh, maybe within persons uh, some conditions that might be well more uh, 
I don't know what the word is. But that might be might make them more influenceable. Influenceable. Uh, I, I get you, I get your question, and yes, um, I and other researchers have looked at exactly that. So, so you, we we can ask, well, under what conditions are people more susceptible to being contaminated? Uh, one answer to that question is if the memory is somewhat older, if if the memory happened in the well into the past, so there's been a significant time for it to fade it becomes more susceptible to contamination. That's an example of a study that, uh, a finding that shows that there are certain conditions that lend themselves to more contamination. Then in other studies, we've looked at well, what kinds of people might be more susceptible. And some of the studies have shown, for example, that young children are more susceptible to uh, having their memory be contaminated than let's say older children or adults. Uh, that's an example of how a, a, a characteristic of the person might be associated with greater susceptibility. Yeah, and and I think this is quite important since, uh, well, that could have a lot of uh, implications uh, in uh, legally, for example, when questioning young children and uh, has this led to the development of new protocols in doing so? Well, there are protocols that have been developed for, for good practices with young yeah. children. And many people, have, I, I haven't worked on those protocols, but many, uh, many good scientists have, uh, have, have done that. Uh, and then just the general um, research on witness memory um, has led to recommendations by psychological scientists about about interviewing witnesses about police practices and procedures that can minimize the chances of contamination so so i'll just give you one example a lot of work has been done on um what's the best way to to ask a witness to try to identify the perpetrator of a crime yeah um so let's say you want to, to show photographs and, and have a witness try to identify a, a person who is suspected of committing a crime. Well, how many photographs should you use? And what uh, should the photographs look like? How similar to the suspect should they be? Do you need to worry about whether they match not only the suspect, but also the description? that the witness originally gave to the police before you even showed any photographs. Who should show those photographs? The chief investigating officer or a completely independent person who doesn't know who the suspect is? These are decisions that can be made in the police station um, that, that can, can drive the way an interview is done that can make a difference. Yes, and well, Regarding this topic, uh, maybe your research has sometimes been uh, controversial for its implications in, in some of these areas. How do you tend to navigate this and uh, what are your general thoughts on these sort of controversies? Well, the, the one area where I have seen quite a bit of controversy um, develop has to do with the reports of some individuals about sexual assault or sexual abuse. Uh, because there are some people in our society who you know, seem to feel like you should believe every story of sexual abuse and sexual assault, that if somebody says it happened, then it happened. Um, but uh, other people feel that, no, you need to investigate. How did that memory come about? Was that was that a memory that developed through some problematic questioning or other suggestive procedures? You, you cannot just accept every claim without any kind of scrutiny. Uh, and, and so there is a lot of controversy in that area, partly because it's such a sensitive topic. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think uh, sometimes people tend to misunderstand uh, having maybe uh, some skepticism regarding the 
how did the memory came to be and why are you testifying uh, versus the actual uh, condonement of the facts, right? Right. Exactly. Because usually when I'm involved in a court case as an expert witness, you know, I don't say whether the witness is right or wrong. I mean, I, I can talk about the conditions uh, under which the person was exposed to an event and later tried to remember the event and and say th these are conditions that can lead to difficulties for people. Uh, but but without independent corroboration, you, you, you don't know if you're dealing with an authentic memory or one that is a product of suggestion or imagination or some other process. Yes. And what about the implications of, of this, uh, well, of your life research on false memories for uh, mental health practices? Because well, that's some of the, the topics that I use to cover the, the most. And I know there are several uh, types of psychotherapy that rely a lot on, on the concept of repressed memories. But how can this uh, result in, in actually a, a worst outcome? Worse. Well, what, 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 what I have seen happen over the, the last few decades that I've been uh, uh, doing research in this area of, of claims of repressed memory, and then also working on uh, actual court cases, is that sometimes a, a person will go into therapy with one kind of problem. Um, maybe she's depressed, or maybe she's got an uh, eating disorder, or maybe she's anxious. And she comes out of this therapy with a different problem. She thinks she was raped for 10 years and, and repressed her memories of all this horrific trauma and, and, and now thinks these memories have returned. She then might accuse her family members, the, the families break apart. There's a, all kinds of misery uh, in these extended families. And, you know, I think the problem here is that there are some therapists who've got one and only one idea about what's wrong with the patient. They see a patient with anxiety and an eating disorder, and they decide the person's been sexually abused, and they're going to try to dig out the memories, um, these allegedly buried trauma memories, and in the process, they've created false memories that have been devastating, not only to the patient, um, but of, of course, to the accused and the extended family members. Yes, yes, because it ultimately <laughs> comes to the to the fact that uh, someone's liberty might be at risk uh, if you're not careful enough. Or, uh, I mean, even the 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 very person who has this implanted memory, uh, it's not that they're lying, but they they if they actually come to believe it or create this false memory, well, this will have future implications. Well, that that's you know that's what's interesting here. Um, that I I believe that these patients who who respond to these suggestive influences, no, they're not deliberately lying. I mean, if you gave them a lie detector test and you believed in the reliability of it, they they would be able to pass the test um, because they they now really um, believe in what they're saying and and. Um, and, and that can be a problem. It's, it can be hard to cross-examine them. It can be hard to uh, disabuse them of a belief that might be false um, and a, a hard problem to fix. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm wondering, are there or do we know of any actual differences in terms of maybe emotional content or brain processes uh, that might distinguish between false memories and uh, actual true memories of events that did happen? Oh, I think you've been listening to some of my talks <laughs> when you asked that question, because I've, I've addressed exactly those questions in some um, speeches recently. Yeah, people ask me a lot, is there any way to tell the difference between a, a true memory and authentic memory? Or, or one that is false, that is a product of suggestion or dreams or imagination or some other process. And we have looked at, well, you know, emotional content. Maybe the true memories are more emotional than the false ones, but 
in some work done by my former PhD, Kara Laney, also work done by Rich McNally uh, from Harvard. Um, false memories can be felt with a great deal of emotion. You can't use emotion as, as a guarantee that you're dealing with an authentic memory. Then we've also looked at neuroimaging to see if you put people into a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine, would you see different neural signals for a true memory and a false memory? And, and the overwhelming finding here is the similarity of those neural signals. So you can't use the brain imaging to reliably decide that this person is telling an accurate story versus one that they might believe in, but is inaccurate. Yeah, it's, it's, this is a tough, uh, a tough problem. Um, it, because we do, you know, well, some memories are genuine and we, we would like to, you know, honor the people with genuine memories and bring them justice, but also not deprive innocent people of all of their rights um, because they happen to be in a situation where they get falsely accused. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think history has provided us with a lot of uh, examples of why uh, it's, I mean, they are not isolated cases, but there are a lot of cases that have been uh, reported on which people are, well, incorrectly trial, tried, tried for some, uh, yes. for some crime. And uh, it definitely, I think definitely it's, it's worth to make these questions in, in order to try and make uh, the conclusions about someone's testimony as uh, reliable as possible. Well, and that, that, you know, that's a goal of a lot of this work to try to figure out, well, what kind of, what kind of practices and policies and procedures um, would the science suggest are, are best for minimizing the chances of error? Um, by the way, I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware that there, there is a project in New York, the Innocence Project, that has gathered information on, you know, approximately 350 known cases of wrongful conviction, people who have been convicted of crimes that we know they didn't do because DNA testing eventually proved that they were actually innocent. And, and when you look at, well, what caused those wrongful convictions? the major cause is faulty memory okay and 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 many of them are are sexual assault cases where the wrong person has been identified and many of them are sexual assault cases where the wrong person who was misidentified was an african american who was wrongly identified by a caucasian um victim a, a genuine victim but she picked out uh, the wrong person. So we see lots of actual cases out there in the real world of tragedy that can result from faulty memory. And I, I like to talk about those findings with my students because I, help, I, I think it helps them appreciate the importance of studying memory. Yes. And so far, we've talked uh, more about uh, these times when maybe uh, uh, an individual received some uh, misinformation, which uh, either messes with an already uh, established memory or creates a new one. But what about when uh, a person doesn't receive any external information? Can one by themselves... Uh, change uh, a memory throughout uh, their life course? Uh, yes, that, that can happen too. Um, what, what people will sometimes do is they'll draw inferences about what might have happened or what could have happened. They can do this as they're thinking about the past and, and maybe thinking about why am I the way I am. And, and those inferences and, and thoughts about what might have happened can turn into memories for these people. So in a way they've suggested things to themselves. We call that auto-suggestion. Uh, and it's, it's another way in which sometimes people have come to remember things that, that mm -hmm. didn't happen. That didn't happen. And, 
And what would be like, uh, or how does your work intersect with other fields? I mean, we've talked a little bit about maybe neuroscience when looking at brain imaging and there is no real distinction uh, between false memories and true memories. And how, how maybe other uh, fields intersect with this one, like maybe artificial intelligence, cognitive psychology? Well, I know you are a psychologist. Or those yeah, are the well, that came to mind. Oh, you mentioned artificial intelligence. Um, one of the ways that some people have uh, contaminated memory is through doctored photographs. Um, if I if I show you a doctored photograph, for example, this was a study um, by Wade at Gary and their collaborators. If I show you a photo of you going up in a hot air balloon ride with your father when you're about five years old, I can get you, it, it's all a doctored photograph, but I can get you to start to think you actually had the experience. So the doctored photograph is, is contaminating your autobiography. Um, now we have even the more sophisticated deep fake videos where yes. you can watch a video of somebody that's, that's completely fake uh, and that person is doing or saying whatever it is you want them to be doing or saying. So here we have an intersection between technology um, as a vehicle for creating false beliefs and, and, and false memories in the minds of people. Um, and I think as these AI techniques and the deep fake technology gets into the hands of many, many, many more people um, as it gets more and more user-friendly, um, there's no telling what, what other people might try to do to us. And, yeah. and how are we going to protect ourselves? How are we going to defend against this? Yeah. Uh, are there ways one can maybe actually... Uh well, protect themselves from, from uh, the creation of false memories? Well, if you, if you warn people that somebody may be trying to mislead you, uh, for example, you, people can hold that warning in mind for a while and use it to kind of fend off invading information. Problem is we don't walk around the world with this like warning in the forefront of our consciousness. And so... Um, yeah, we know that that can work a little bit, but um, practically speaking, we're going to probably have to find some better ways to deal with this. But yeah, stop it, getting people to stop and think, is this real? Is this fake? Is this an error? Um, can help them to some extent to, okay. to be a bit skeptical. Okay, so yeah, the fact, uh, the knowing of the actual uh, nature of memory and how malleable it can be uh, by itself can be useful. Uh, I, yeah, I think it is useful. As a matter of fact, I, I collaborated in a couple of projects recently on uh, what happens to people who participate in these false memory experiments. Uh, okay, down the yeah. road, you know, where are they? What what do they have in mind? Uh, um, do they still have little bits of fiction in their mind? And in one of those studies, we actually showed that going through one of these experiments and mm -hmm. being told at the end what it was all about, the debriefing process, yes. uh, actually for at least a short period of time makes them more resistant to further attempts to manipulate them. Okay. Uh, and I think that points to the... Well, to the importance of uh, mm, uh, thinking about our own uh, cognition, uh, not only about the nature of memory, but also a lot of cognitive biases and heuristics that we uh, may be susceptible to in order to develop critical thinking, uh, especially in a world that's uh, even, uh, with the advent of the internet and all this information, uh, which is filled with misinformation. Well, that, now that's another, that's, that's a cousin of this problem. We've got, we've got, got a problem with misinformation and disinformation, which is sort of deliberately trying to contaminate somebody as opposed to kind of accidentally contaminating somebody. Um, and 
he, here the problem is you, uh, that society is facing is that people are putting out misinformation about some important aspect of society. I, I, I deliberately contaminate people's personal memories, but out there in social media, we see people contaminating people about, for example, health issues, the COVID treatments, uh, or about climate change. Is it real? Is it not? Does it, is it caused by humans or isn't it? And so on. And, and misinformation can be very dangerous because it can keep people from seeking help that would, would make them better and happier, uh, or it can recommend things that are harmful to them. Um, so how do we, how do we stop that? And I think maybe we're going to need a cooperation with the social media companies to try to figure out how to how to combat this. And and so, for example, I had a, I had the experience not long ago where I was on Facebook and somebody posted an article on Facebook and I thought, oh, this looks so interesting. So I went to share it uh, with my my Facebook friends. And up popped this message. Do you realize this article that you're about to share is eight years old? And I go, oh, no. I, I thought it was a brand new article and I was going to be sharing something new. I don't really want to be sharing an eight-year-old article. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Um, yeah. uh, so that capability to pop up and say, I don't know, there have been 18 complaints about this information not being true. Are you sure you want to share it? Um, might be one way in which we can make a little dent in this problem of the uh, proliferation of misinformation yeah. and disinformation. Yes. Uh, well, at least you take the time to rethink it and not uh, follow like this automatic uh, movement of uh share and it's all over there yes okay i i actually don't think i have received some sort of uh, notification in social media about that but I, I i think it's a good measure and dr love to say just have a couple more questions i don't want to take a lot of your time the first one is uh what would be uh if if any the ethical implications surrounding the creation or suppression of false memories uh is there like a a positive side uh where are we uh right now well uh, okay i've given a few examples about how you can introduce error into uh, people's memories um but there are other examples where um what we've done is uh, uh for example plant a false memory um, that you've got sick eating a, a fattening food and then people don't want to eat the food as much anymore. Or you can plan a false memory that when you were a kid, you you know, ha had a warm, fuzzy experience with a healthy food. People want to eat more of the healthy food. So the idea that we can use this mind engineering and affect people's behavior and maybe their nutritional choices, maybe make a dent in the obesity problem in our society, does raise the question of, should we be doing this to people? Should we, should we plant positive and negative memories that will help people live a happier or a healthier life? It's kind of a scary idea. Should we ban the use of it because it's scary? Um, that's not for me as a cognitive psychologist to decide, but it is for society to say, when should we promote these um, practices and when when should we limit them? Yes. Yeah, I, I think people sometimes uh, forget that, uh, well, as, a, as scientists, we study some sort of phenomenon, try to uh, seek the explanations, try to uh find the applications but it ultimately is society's decision as whether how this knowledge is used mm -hmm. right exactly 
Okay, and finally, uh, Dr. Loftus, what are some current limitations in our understanding of false memories and what do you hope uh, future research will uncover? Um, well, one thing, one thing that could happen in the future is kind of a, a the, I use behavioral techniques, asking suggestive questions, exposing people to another witness's version of what happened. Um, but we we might find with certain pharmaceutical interventions of certain drugs of certain kinds, it makes people kind of even more susceptible to this kind of contamination. Uh, and so I, I I can envision work where that kind of um, study is done and that, that would just show an even more powerful method of, of changing what it is people believe and remember. We're still going to have to face all the ethical issues of when do we use this uh, idea? Do we ban the use of the idea? But we'll be learning more and more about about the malleability of our memories. Yes. And maybe some tips for uh, maybe some uh, students who are interested in uh, in the topic of memory and maybe uh, they'd like to start in a research program. Uh, do you have any tips for them? Well, I, I think, I mean, the, the best thing to do would be to find uh, to find a faculty member who is doing research on memory and try to join that project. I mean, because for a student to start out and, you know, figure out how to how to do these kinds of studies and get the resources and materials is they're going to need some some help. Um, but for students who just want to read more, for example, in, on my U UC Irvine website, I have posted all kinds of articles uh, that people can just download for free if they want to read more about this issue. Excellent. So I'll make sure to leave that link in the description of the of the video. So, I mean, I know it's very little time to talk uh, about a, such an extensive topic, but uh, I'll leave the link so people, if they want to learn more about it, can go and start reading and start looking into uh, your your research and your other people's research regarding uh, memory. Well, also they uh, you know they could watch my TED talk and 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 yeah. it'll have us uh, Spanish subtitles. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> TED, TED talks usually are are translated into a translated. A bunch of... So there's all kinds of ways to learn a little bit more about this. Yeah. So I'll go. I'll go ahead and leave some links so they can go and hear some of your interviews and look into your research, and uh, so they can go ahead and learn more about the topic. Great. Well, thank you so awesome. much, uh, Dr. Loftus. I'm so grateful for uh, you having taken the time to talk a little bit with us about your research, and hope you have a great day. Oh, and thank you for your questions. You re you really did your research, and you're a very good interviewer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.